in the tradition of Malcolm X. Peace be unto you. This reading is from my book, The Resurrection of the Dead, The Beatific Vision in the Hebraic, Christian, and Islamic Scriptures. Chapter 9 Rise, Lazarus! The Gospel of John was written about 100 years after the death of Jesus, Isa, of Nazareth. The story of Lazarus' death covers only 44 verses in the book. Let's assume the incident didn't really occur. But it is one of the most influential mystical dramas ever portrayed in the New Testament. Does it have a moral? like a fable from a supper. Major mystical themes crisscross this dramatic narrative to flush our ultimate life issues, such as life after death. Here, two premises are foundational. There is a light of this natural world and there is a light in us. The former is good for walking, for instance, in the day, whereas the latter is our power of luminous insight, which is good for walking without being reckless in the night. It is our inner light, not of the sun, but of God. The allegory of Lazarus's death is a dramatization of the human predicament and the soul's initiation into noetic vision. First, there is the sickness of Lazarus. Implied is the inevitability of infirmity of some kind during our life. It is not made clear in the story what caused Lazarus's sickness. But no sooner have we been made aware of Lazarus's sickness then it is followed by Jesus' announcement that, and I quote, this sickness is not unto death. This is an interesting statement. On the surface, one might think Jesus simply means that it is a minor illness like a common cold. But there is a deeper implication Jesus is pointing to. It also means that the human predicament need not be one which necessarily leads to death if there is an intervention. Lazarus does die, but we are never told why he died other than he had fallen ill. Jesus then uses a metaphor for death. It suggests that there are two deaths. One is physical, that's obvious. We, like Lazarus, are born into the world. And in that moment, we, like a solid piece of wood, are subject to the draw knife of life, relentlessly shredding the very substance of life from us till there is nothing left but sawdust on the carpenter's floor. The other one is mental death. It is not so obvious because it mirrors our hidden social identity, the subconscious. We are generally predisposed to external interests and attachments, whereas we are not very introspective on what makes us the social person that we are. In a nuanced manner, that truth was revealed to his disciples when Jesus says, and I quote, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep, end quote. The truth is that our souls are not noetically conscious at birth. Thus, there is a deep mental sleep we each suffer, as does Lazarus in the narrative. It is true, one may be consciously functional in the world, but not noetically conscious. Such a mental condition is analogous to sleepwalking through our life orientation. We see that 
Later in the narrative, when Jesus chooses not to attend an annual Passover ritual, this, therefore, is another suggestion. It is that a mediator is needed to awaken Lazarus out of his sleep into noetic vision. Moses, Musa, Jesus, Isa, and Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, were mystically asleep too, before they awakened by the Logos or Holy Spirit, sometimes called an angel, they were noetically asleep. But the death of Lazarus is enough to make the point about what ails us during our lives. For example, aging in and of itself is falling ill because our bodies ability to regenerate cells continuously declines after a certain age. That decreasing ability to regenerate cells eventually reaches a tipping point. Beyond that critical point, biological imbalance sets in because the ratio of regenerated cells to dead or dying cells swings toward death. We are then more dead than alive. It is an irreversible process throughout all life forms. It is another instance of the ironclad law of entropy. Medical treatments may slow it down, but no treatment with medicines nor surgeries can stop the physical degeneration of the body. When Jesus finally arrives at Martha's home, she emph emphatically states to him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died, end quote. It is understandable that with our limited consciousness, we would presuppose that death could be prevented if only it was stopped by a technology prior to death. But death preempts all time and space. And as I said, it is inevitable. The natural body is in obedience to the natural law of entropy. But the noetic law is supernatural and trumps natural law societal and cultural customs, not by violating them, but by taking what belongs to God to God. This scene reminds me of Inger Bergman's great film, The Seventh Seal. Death is independent of life circumstances. The symbolism is rich and runs counter to our experiences. Lazarus was physically dead. He had been dead for four days. His body was swollen and had a putrid smell of death and was wrapped in flax cloth and buried in a dark cave. We are told that Jesus wept upon being told the cold facts. No one was referencing within a natural context how it could be believed that he couldn't be brought back to life. This is one of the great mystical allegories in the New Testament because it is a dramatization of the resurrection of the soul and its rebirth, its second birth, from what is organic into a new kind of non-material or non-physical inorganic creature, not of flesh and bones, not of this world. But how could that happen? Ask yourself this. How unlikely is it that you would even be born a natural creature? Statistically, it was nearly impossible. Yet, here you are, and reading and comprehending too and not dependent on any of your ancestors to be alive at the same time that you are. How unlikely was it that you would be reading markings with abstract meaning which you actually comprehend intellectually? Here Jesus plays the role of the unseen logos or memora. He is the medium in which and by which the human mind unites with the noetic thought of God, the supreme being, 
without which no mind can see the light of God. It is the mystical meaning of what Jesus speaks as the Logos. The Logos is a major subject of the book of John. It is implicit in the meaning of these words spoken by Jesus. And let me quote, I am the resurrection and the life. The one believing in me, if he should die, will live, end quote. It is not obvious to the casual reader that the meaning of this statement has to do with noetic resurrection because the dramatization uses the image of Jesus and the first person singular to make the point. But the infinitive, and I quote, I am, end quote, in this statement is the same as that nameless God in the book of Exodus saying to Moses, Musa, to tell Pharaoh, quote, I am, end quote, sent him. Historically, priests have always assumed that the masses of people could not understand what the deep spiritual import of noetic resurrection meant. Because it was expressed in so many languages, the I am phrase combined with poor teaching gradually led to a lack of clarification about its meaning. The resulting confusion has frustrated people's interest to understand it. But a big clue to the meaning of the statement follows. Jesus follows that with yet another bold declaration. He states that those resurrected will be in noetic vision or face to face with God. He said, and I quote, said I not unto thee that if you wouldest believe, you should see the glory of God. That statement is direct and to the point. It is a noetic awakening which is the soul's end, the soul's end of its journey. It is not a physical resurrection. It is spiritual law which governs the soul, not natural law. So yes, you can shout, and I quote, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? End quote. The Sermon on the Mount reveals the noetic goal. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God, end quote. He then cries out to God, revealing his mind to be the medium of the Logos, of the one God. And I quote, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, end quote. Then Jesus, having unbound Lazarus, allowed him to go because Lazarus had been raised from noetic death. After that day, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that time, conspired to kill him because they feared the power, authority, status, and wealth that they had was at risk. End of chapter 9.